Welcome everybody. You are now in our webinar today. So welcome. Uh, we are now expecting 304 participants from 44 countries. Uh, our webinar is entitled International Trade in Crops with New Breeding Technologies, the Australian Perspective. This is the first webinar co-organized by the Mardak University, Perth, Australia. The implementer of the package assisting small exporters are PASE and hosted by ISA Southeast Asia Center based in the Philippines. The International Service for the Acquisition of Agribiotic Applications is a not for profit charitable organization working towards enabling capacities of developing countries to harness the benefits of biotechnology. I am your host, uh, Dr. Dora Romero Aldemira, Director of ISA Southeast Asia Center in the Philippines and the Global Knowledge Center of Crop Biotechnology. Well, I'm a trained scientist with a doctorate of, in biotechnology and plant physiology from Purdue University, USA, and postdoctoral fellowship from Albert Ludwigs University in Freiburg, Germany on the molecular biology and biochemistry of golden rice, the beta carotene and rich rice. We gratefully acknowledge also the members of the ISA Biotech Information Cent uh, Network, Bi Biotechnology Information Center Networks. So we have there, uh, when you see the logos in Malaysia, Chinese Society for Biotech, Indonesia Biotech Information Center, Nippon in Japan, Pakistan, Big Karachi, and the Lahore chapter, Vietnam Biotech Information Service, and the Circa Philippines, and in Thailand, the Biotechnology Alliance Association of Thailand. Okay, developments in regulation of gene edited plants are changing rapidly. Increasingly more countries, including Australia, have implemented the deregulation of gene edited crops. In Australia, this followed a series of reviews by the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator. Common approaches are also emerging among many countries. So during this webinar, our experts, our panelists will discuss the following, building international capacity for gene editing, science diplomacy, policy and regulatory aspects of crops developed through new breeding technologies, the regulatory landscape of gene edited crops in Australia, and NVP policy approaches and implications for trade in Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia. This webinar will run for one hour and a half and we are currently on live streaming at the ISA FD Facebook and YouTube channel. So all our microphones are on mute and questions should be entered in the Q&A function, okay? You can start putting in your question as soon as the first speaker finishes. So the chat function will be used by the panelists and for important messages to the participants. Thank you all for responding to our pre-webinar surveys. And at the end of the webinar, we will provide a link to a post-webinar survey and respondents will be given certificates. So I, I don't want to see any, quest, any queries on, are we giving away certificates? So let's start the ball rolling. And our first speaker, uh, I'd like to introduce him to you is uh, Professor Michael Jones. Is an internationally recognized leader in agricultural biotechnology. He is a professor of plant sciences and agricultural biotechnology of Mardak University and the foundation director of the West Australian State Agricultural Biotechnology Center. He has worked internationally with the departments of biochemistry, plant pathology, developmental biology, and plant breeding. He pioneered research on molecular markers for crop improvement and molecular biotech-based agricultural R&D in Western Australia and has supervised more than 50 PhD students and has 275 peer-reviewed publications. Current uh, research focus are on applying new breeding technologies to crop improvement and on translation of research outcomes to commercial implementation. He has co-founded two companies and he had obtained his degree in natural sciences, major in biochemistry and PhD in, in biochemistry from Cambridge University, UK. Let's welcome Dr. Jones, Professor Michael Jones. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Olaf, for your very kind introduction. And first, on, on behalf of my colleagues, I would like 
to express my sincere thanks to the ISA team and, <clears throat> and to you and Maha in particular for enab enabling us to have this joint webinar. ISA has been doing a great job in this area for many years, <clears throat> but with more of, on a focus in the countries in Southeast Asia. And of course, Australia is uh, intimately involved uh, with the countries of Southeast Asia and more so as time progresses. And what we're trying, uh, hoping to do here from our part is to help move the debate forward and concentrate on developing a clear path to market for gene edited products. So uh, <clears throat> we have a, a project funded by the, the Commonwealth Government on building capacity for small exporters to exploit new breeding technologies. And this is part of a package assisting small exporters program. Um, <clears throat> So, Australia, well, it's a food exporting nation. It may export minerals as well, but it's a food exporting nation. And uh, so this project then is a forward-looking project with the primary aim of enabling Australian grains and horticultural industries to be the first movers in applying new breeding technologies to crop improvement. Um, <clears throat> and as part of that, we have to provide information on new science and technologies, and on policies and regulations that relate to them, relate to them both in Australia and with our trading partners. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have an additional aim, and that is to help promote international harmonisation of regulations and to re re reduce barriers to trade. So in this programme, we have another a number of supporting partners. Uh, so the Commonwealth Government, Murdoch University, Department of Primary Industries in Western Australia, we have peak bodies like Australian Seed Federation and Crop Life Australia, who you'll hear from. Um, exporters like CBH Group, bulk exporters, breeders, uh, small companies, Grain Growers Association, and, small, and other small exporters. So <clears throat> why are we interested in this topic? Well, as you can see here on this slide, uh, this is for Australian wheat, wheat exports between 2016 and 20. And you can see that out of the top 10 countries, eight of those are in Southeast Asia. And uh, these 10 countries are responsible for 70 to 80% of the uh, importing, uh, imports from Australia. Uh, and that's just these 10 countries, that's worth $4.6 billion uh, in trade. So that's a large amount. Similarly, if we look at Bali uh, over the same period, um, this was the situation up until 2020. Uh, unfortunately, China has imposed an 80% tariff on uh, Australian barley, so that this will swap uh, change in uh, future years. But actually, the uh, what has been exported to China has mainly been taken up by other countries. And again, most the majority of these countries are in Southeast Asia, but we also have Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Kuwait, and uh, Qatar as well. And the value of the, this trade is $1.6 billion a year. Canola, uh, slightly different form, but as you can see again, major exports, well, through the European Union, but then the rest of China, Japan, uh, Pakistan, UAE, Nepal, and Malaysia. And it's interesting in this particular case because this includes GM canola. Uh, about 25% of the canola in Australia is GM, and uh, about in Western Australia, it's a little, a little bit higher, it's about 35%. We look at fruit and veg exports. Again, there's a lot of information on this slide, but the only thing you need to look at is the fact that 77% of all the fruit and vegetable exports from Australia go to Asia. So again, uh, this is the, the region, we're in this region, uh, and this is who we trade with. Well, <clears throat> Australia, though, is an ancient and weathered continent, and so that presents challenges to crop production. Uh, for grains and cereals, often it's water limited, soils often nutrient poor, uh, suffer from drought and heat stress, and Australia is actually fortunate in not having many pests of, of the global pests and diseases, and so we also there's strong effort to prevent incursions of new pests and diseases. But what this means if we are going to be uh, competitive is that we need to apply the best science and technology to improve yields and quality, and that includes gene editing. 
So if we look at conventional new breeding technologies, are oh, they fit together? Uh, on the left, you'll see a, a, a simplified conventional breeding program where you might have a beneficial gene in blue from a wild relative that's crossed with a, a cultivar. Uh, and then after F1 generation, back crossed uh, to produce a new cultivar. Uh, but what you'll see is that due to linkage drag, there are unwanted genes transferred as well. So it's not very precise. If you look at a transgenic or, or biotech approach, you can isolate the beneficial gene directly, usually transfer it using agrobacterium into the cultivar and obtain a new cultivar, and that the gene transfer is much more precise. And what you can see here, of course, is we've got, I've got three uh, names, transgenesis, cisgenesis, and intragenesis. The methodology is exactly the same, but uh, transgenesis is from unrelated organisms, cisgenesis from related uh, species or the same gene pool, intragenesis gene or components of genes from the same species, and they may, may be looked on differently in different jurisdictions. And then in the last decade, gene editing has come on in leaps and bounds. And so that's just, just shown here as targeted mutagenesis where uh, and I'm going to be focusing on SDN1, which we will talk more about, uh, making specific uh, targeted changes in the variety. Uh, here's a, a, a scheme taken from a paper by Garrett um, from Cell, and this compares crossbreeding or conventional breeding, which of course, uh, actually is defined by the Australian Gene Technology Act as, as genetic manipulation. Uh, but then excluded from the regulations. Uh, back crossings required, transgene free. Mutation breeding, random mutagenesis, many breaks across the genome, but again, it doesn't involve transgenes, takes quite a long time to market. Then transgenic breeding, introducing traits from other organisms, uh, external DNA integrated, and that is then subject to GM regulations, which extends often extends the time to market. And then uh, genome editing, or I prefer the term gene editing, targeted mutagenesis, back crossing is not required, and that speeds up the whole process of getting uh, of the path to market. So looking at these gene editing technologies, uh, ISA has already had some webinars actually on the technology, so I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but it started with zinc finger nucleases, then talons, and more recently, CRISPR-Cas9 based systems. Uh, and these systems are all based on the production uh, and repair of double-stranded breaks using either process of non-homologous end joining or homology directed repair. So looking at uh, specifically at uh, non-homologous end joining, the orange here is a, a Cas9, a double-stranded nuclease, and it is guided by the green guide RNA to make uh, cuts at a precise point in both strands of the DNA. Uh, in repair mechanisms then, the uh, organism, including plants, make it, uh, errors at the repair site. There could be insertions, deletions, or mutations, and those uh, uh, can then generate loss of function or, or, or change of function of that sequence. Uh, if you add uh, donor DNA with homology dependent repair, then it's possible to add one or more or even a whole new gene in at that site. So non-homologous end joining is called SDN1. SDN2 is the addition of a few uh, bases and SDN3 is more bases, for example, up to a full gene. So <clears throat> this technology is advancing right, very rapidly. And so the sequence deletion and insertion or replacement, DNA, uh, DNA free editing. So you can combine the Cas9 and the guide RNA to form ribonuclear proteins, base substitution, prime editing, gene segment deletion, gene expression changes, and epigenetic changes. Uh, so uh, I don't have time to talk about these, uh, but this field is advancing very rapidly. Now, Let's look at the power of the SDN1 gene editing for crop improvement. And what you can see uh, here uh, in two examples are for wheat, a gene editing of six MLO uh, alleles in bred wheat. 
to confer resistance to powdery mildew. And so um, actually the MLO gene is a gene for susceptibility to powdery mildew. And if all six copies of the MLO gene are mutated, so you can see on the right of the panel, the leaves, then you get resistance to powdery mildew. Similarly, work from Abbe et al, uh, triple recessive mutation alters seed dormancy in wheat. So if you uh, treat heads equally with water, the ones on the left uh, are the wild type, the ones on the right have been edited to prevent um, pre-harvest sprouting, which otherwise reduce, reduces grain quality and value. Uh, these technologies can be applied to horticultural crops as well. Here's an example from work in our lot by uh, Dr. Sadia Iqbal. Uh, she's used both a transgenic and a non-transgenic approach in, to edit potato. And potato is actually more difficult because it's a, uh, a tetraploid, hexaploid, uh, sort of, uh, homo, heterozygous tetraploid. And it means that you can't cross it or you'll lose the variety. So for example, in RNP uh, based, uh, editing. You can combine the Cas9 and the RNP separately without any DNA present, shoot those into leaf cells with particle bombardment, regenerate shoots uh, and grow plants back. And you can see here in the work she was doing to edit starch branching enzymes, the aim was to increase the level of amylose, which is resistant starch. And you can see that the level has gone from 20% in the wild type to uh, both in transgenic SDN1 um, and uh, RNP up to about 43%. So this uh, reduces uh, glucose release into the bloodstream and hopefully helps reduce type 2 diabetes and improves uh, bowel health as well. So if we look at the regulations in Australia, then uh, living organisms are regulated by the Gene Technology Act and administered by the um, OGTR. And uh, in 2019, SDN1 uh, technology uh, was deregulated in Australia. I'm going to focus only on that. But if you have food products, they're regulated by Fazans, Food Standards New Zealand, um, Australia, New Zealand, and that is still under review, but, uh, and for public comment in the mid year, but they will consider applications for commercial GE products uh, at the moment. So if we look at the current status of regulation of GE crops, we're talking about now SDN1 crops, which have been deregulated in green. You'll see most of uh, North and South America have deregulated SDN1 crops and sometimes SDN2, South Africa, Australia, Japan as well, for example. In the blue countries, there's uh, ongoing discussion with recommendations to deregulate SDN1 crops. And in red, the gene edited crops are still regulated as uh, GM crops, and that's in particular the case in Europe and New Zealand. So uh, let's have a look at uh, Argentina, which is probably the most advanced here in, in their uh, gene editing regulations. And they have five years experience of gene edited products. And that what they found is that there is much faster development from bench to market than for GMOs. So, as you can see in the blue, uh, the blue lines or blue uh, uh, diamonds, that's, that's GMO events. And in the red dots and the red line here relate to new breeding technology. In other words, um, SDM1, a gene edited technology. You can see the difference in the speed. And um, if you look at the developer, developer profiles of who's, what's happened as a result, you can see that GM products for 20 years the ones that have been deregulated were from foreign, 90% were foreign multinationals, 8% uh, local companies and 2% small SME, small companies. But for gene edited products, which have been deregulated for five years, there's an absolute uh, game changer here. 59% local companies and public research, 32% SMEs and only 9% foreign multinationals. So, this really GE technology, if deregulated, absolutely uh, democratizes the technology. So many public institutions, and public research organizations, sport and SMEs can use that technology for more diversified traits and plant species. So looking at the path to market, 
Well, if you had an RNA, RNP product with SDN1 with no introduced DNA, now that should be treated as a conventionally bred product. If you use uh, an expression vector to get the editing, that will still be captured by a GM trigger, but you, in many crops, you can self those, select null segregants, which have been edited, but have no introduced DNA. And again, those should fall out of the regulatory system and be treated as conventionally bred crops. So um, <clears throat> looking to the future, um, Fazants, we want Fazants, the Food Authority to accept SDM1 gene edited food, no external DNA as non-GM. What we do not want is an additional tier of regulations for gene editing crops and products. That's to say same treatment for SDN1 crops and food as, as from conventional breeding. We need public acceptance of gene edited crops and food. And in relation to that, I would like to see the term gene editing rather than genome editing, um, because our experience in the past is that any little word or change or subtlety can sometimes be picked up by those who uh, oppose uh, new breeding technologies of one sort or another. We also need to counter any EU influence on GE legislation, provide industry and government with updates and quality briefings, and uh, help promote harmonization of international regulations for GE crops and produce. Now, my last couple of slides, I would like to quote from two recent ISA webinars. And the first one is a quote from uh, Jose Jimmy Botello from um, University of Queensland. Paradoxically, <clears throat> the main challenge facing GMO editing is not scientific, but political. It defies logic by introducing one single mutation in a specific genomic locus with extreme precision using CAS effectors is subject to strict regulations in some countries while introducing thousands of simultaneous mutations in a completely uncontrolled manner by chemical or physical random mutagenesis methods is not regulated. And similarly, and a quote from a separate ISIS webinar by Professor Jim Whelan from La Trobe, Feeding the world is not a scientific problem, it's a regulatory problem. And so, of course, this is why we uh, are interested in, in holding these discussions and understanding uh, and helping to uh, hopefully helping to influence the uh, policies and regulations in our neighboring and trading countries and friends in Southeast Asia. So with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jones. Uh, we, now you know uh, where uh, uh, Professor Jones placed himself. He is an avid ISA webinar uh, <laughs> participant. So thank you so much for the comprehensive presentation of the science and opportunities of new breeding technologies in Australia. And I'd like to invite our participants to please put your questions in the Q&A function. Uh, it's very hard to look at them in the chat box. So please put them in the Q&A. Now let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, Mohammed Adil is a career diplomat with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Pakistan. He is also a PhD scholar at the West, Western Australia State Agricultural Biotechnology Center in Australia, where his works look at the variation of regulation of biotechnology and genome editing in different countries, along with the role of science diplomacy. He was the manager of Pakistan Biotechnology Information Center at FC College Lahore. So he's one, he's a family actually, which was involved in science policy and communication linkages for biotechnology applications. He has spoken on forums such as TEDx on the social perspectives of biotechnology and initiated science diplomacy trainings in Australia for early career researchers which was awarded as the best education initiative by the Council of Australian Postgraduate Association. He completed his bachelor's and MPhil in biotech from FC College, Lahore, Pakistan. Let's welcome Mr. Adil Muhammad. First of all, thank you for that uh, flattering introduction. And I would like to also echo uh, what Mike said regarding ISA support. So having you know uh, worked uh, at one of the bigs in Pakistan, uh, I can appreciate the efforts that ISA has been doing to not only educate 
people uh, in the domain of agriculture biotechnology, but also giving them much needed support. Uh, so Mike's presentation uh, provides me an ideal segue to talk about uh, regulatory and policy driven perspectives. So uh, what we essentially see uh, currently is that, you know, there are silos uh, with regards to how science and policies are working. So during the course of my presentation, I'll talk about uh, regulatory triggers and the landscape. Uh, what are the international negotiation interfaces? How can science diplomacy facilitate and potentially pathways to market? So uh, the need uh, for talking about science policy, science diplomacy and regulation, it stems from the fact that regulations, they are not uh, based on scientific assessment, but also socio-economic and political uh, considerations. Then there are different international interfaces. So how uh, different countries uh, through forums such as the United Nations and regional forums discuss and debate uh, how to benefit uh, and regulate uh, emerging technologies such as uh, biotechnology. So there is also this uh, clash between different streams of international law, as I'll discuss subsequently that different regimes, uh, they may potentially kind of confuse uh, how to go forward uh, in benefiting from biotechnology. Then uh, there's also, as Mike expanded on, you know, uh, there's a false dichotomy of nomenclature as well. As we go forward with innovations and how interdisciplinary approaches and convergence of different technologies are enabling uh, innovators uh, there's a need to, you know, uh, uh, go away with or, you know, do away with false dichotomies. So is it a GMO or not a GMO? Is it gene editing or GM? That is basically, you know, further complicating the policy processes. So the, the development of genome editing and its facilitation by converging technologies such as nanotech and, you know, artificial intelligence at some level as well, it, it, it indicates that, you know, this uh, 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 nomenclature of exact GMOs is problematic. And then setting the regulatory bar too high, it, it basically enables uh, the monopoly of you know, uh, certain corporations and reduces competition at the end of the day. So it leads to institutional drift. So uh, there's also the need to uh, further discuss uh, what's happening uh, at the larger level. So uh, within Australia, uh, how the process began was through a technical review of the gene technology regulation. So OGTR, which is the Office of Gene Technology Regulations, that is uh, the lead organization that is leading the process. So uh, the options uh, that they basically provided in the survey, and that is the template of options that is provided, you know, globally by different countries, uh, is to, you know, uh, no amendments to the existing regula regulation. So you treat uh, gene editing uh, as, uh, you know, modification or the previous regulations. The second option is to regulate certain aspects of new technologies. For example, if it is SDN1 deregulated, uh, or, you know, just uh, some component of it. Option three is regulate some new technologies based on the process queues. So th that's where I'll talk more about regulatory triggers uh, in the next slide. And then exclude uh, certain new technologies from regulation on the basis of outcomes that produce. So that's basically a product driven trigger. So these are the basically options that are being provided, uh, you know, uh, globally uh, during the legislative and policy making process. So what was the uh, thematic outcomes of the OGTR review? Uh, what were the key themes? So this is based, uh, this is a content analysis of uh, the feedback that was received from more than 40 different organization and the assessments that they uh, basically produce. Uh, all of this is available on OGTR website. So what, what was the thinking and the mindset of uh, industry, uh, uh, NGOs, as well as researchers? Uh, they said that gene editing is not GMO. So that is something that is, they're trying to push that consensus that uh, the characteristics of the final product and not the process should be used as a criteria. Uh, there's also this ambition and thought that gene editing can deliver a new green revolution. Uh, then thirdly, uh, gene editing can democratize agriculture's biotechnologies. Uh, so because if we do uh, deregulate uh, gene editing, then it can basically enable researchers to access those technologies and provide new innovations. Then gene editing should be regulated. So now we go towards the other side of the spectrum, uh, the threat to organic industries and threat to you know trade because of deregulation, biosafety and biosecurity assessment, and there may be a harm to consumer choice. So this is the prevalent mindset, and it is uh, also indicative of the consumer and the industry choice. So when we're looking at the the policy continuum of regulation, these are basically the choices that different countries and even international organizations have when they are looking to regulate uh, biotechnology. So on one side of the spectrum, we have a promotion approach uh, where there's, you know, uh, corporations and industries allowed to, you know, dominate uh, uh, the commercialization of biotechnology. 
And on the other side of the spectrum, we have a preventive approach where there's excessive restriction and uh, there are trade barriers as well. So what we're seeing right now is uh, somewhere uh, in between permissive and precautionary. So uh, within the permissive, uh, there's a case-by-case -case screening for demonstrated risk. There's more element of science-based uh, uh, you know, regulations coming in then uh, the adoption of different trade standards. While the pre precautionary principle, which the European Union uh, has tried to champion, uh, it focuses on if, that, if there's a potential for uh, a technology to cause harm, there should be regulations. But who decides what the spectrum of the regulation is? So, so these are pertinent questions, and this is why it's, it's not a black and white process. You have to look at the entire dimension. So coming to regulatory triggers, and uh, so, these are uh, basically, there's a uh, two classification regimes right now. Uh, the product-based classification, you look at the end product or the entire process used. So based on the country's legislation or regulatory requirement, you may uh, end up with a uh, product or a process-based. But uh, how gene editing is evolving and the diversity of choices it offers, you have to move beyond the GM binary. You cannot just look alone at a product and a process-based uh, uh, classification regime. So uh, what are the legal foundations and regulatory mechanisms? And important correlations is that countries that have effective biosafety acts, that have biosafety legislations, are those countries which actually have some or effective level of regulatory mechanisms for biotechnology. So the, the, the initial prerequisite is that countries need to have a, you know, effective gene technology act, biosafety laws, so that they're able to provide uh, their researchers and the industry with a uh, effective outline. So based on the legislation, uh, it also kind of reflects the regulatory mechanism that they have. So we can look that, you know, uh, there's a transatlantic divide. Uh, so not in, within the North America, it's a more product-based uh, classification regime, while towards the, the European Union, uh, there's a process uh, driven. Coming towards the international regulation, this is one aspect that is not discussed uh, uh, to, uh, to a great extent. Uh, in many discussions on uh, agricultural biotechnology is that there is a diversity of international regulations of biotechnology. So, such as from uh, the disarmament perspective, you have to look at the biological and toxins weapon convention. From a uh, health perspective, there's the uh, international health regulations of 2005, the Cartagena protocol, which a number of countries refer to while making their own uh, re regulations and legislations related to agricultural biotechnology. Then coming to trade, uh, it's uh, the World Trade Organization, which provides the sanitary and phytosanitary measure. And that's basically over here and over here, there's a transatlantic divide. So, uh, and there's a potential for treaty conflicts. Then obviously social impact. So there's a, on, on a parallel, there is also a discussion on the ethics of human genome editing. So as you can see, this is an entire spectrum and different actors are discussing this and debating this. So uh, it's 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 not a, a, a dichotomy between GM and non-GM or gene editing versus GM. It's a whole spectrum. And sometimes during the discussion, this goes amiss. So uh, Latin America is a great example on how it is taking the lead in deregulation of genome gene edited products. Uh, there's uh, an objective of, you know, uh, in order to promote agriculture biotechnology, we want harmonization. Uh, while you know large scale universal harmonization is difficult, but Latin America has provided a great example as to how harmonization can potentially work. So as you can see, it, all of them, their legal basis, it's it, they are harmonized to a large extent, uh, and there's regional cooperation between these countries. It's a lesson that many other countries can learn from, and and by basically harmonizing their assessment regimes as well, they're promoting trade between those countries. So uh, it's it's both science and the trade of agricultural biotechnology that is going ahead. Argentina, in fact, took the lead uh, in uh, deregulating STN1 and providing a roadmap on how it wants to go forward. Another example for, for this would be a regulatory regime between the US and Japan. So over here, while US uh, does a three-tier regulatory regime based on how the product evolves, uh, the Japanese regulation, they uh, basically derive the definitions from the Cartagena protocol. So at the end of the day, it is also dependent on how consumer perception, uh, 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 basically, if the consumer are looking forward to, you know, benefiting from uh, biotech products. So based on this, uh, what are the key issues? As I've said earlier, there's an institutional drift. So technology is evolving faster than regulations. Uh, within the Cartagena protocol, there is still the ongoing debate on how to go forward with gene editing. And it's going at a very slow pace. So there's institutional drift and new and new technologies are coming in. There's potential for treaty conflict uh, because uh, conflicting mandates of Cartagena Protocol versus the World Trade Organization. Crucially, there's this also battle of how do you define risk? 
uh, there's this proposition that it should be just scientific based, but uh, within the European Union, they also talk about the socioeconomic dimension. But how do you quantify the socioeconomic dimension? So this is where you need an interface where scientists, uh, uh, people from uh, natural sciences, social scientists, uh, and the policymakers, they can come together on a platform to discuss and debate these issues. Then obviously convergence, so if you bring in nano uh, quantum biology, bioinformatics, you are increasing uh, the technological landscape. So how do you go forward with these regulations? So uh, this provides me a segue towards science diplomacy is and does. So uh, the basic pitch is that the problem we face, uh, they are, you know, they're global in nature. Uh, crucially, they all have a scientific dimension attached to it. If they are cross-border and global in nature, no country or a single, you know, discipline of scientists can solve them on their own. So science is a global enterprise. It's not a hegemony of a single state. Uh, they all have a scientific component, often obvious, and the science or the scientific method, it's a, it's, a, it's a natural harmonizing language, science as it's practiced across the world. So what is the framework of science diplomacy? There are different typologies of how science diplomacy is perceived and practiced. I will not go into too much detail uh, on that, but I'll just br briefly introduce the concept. So it's, it's science diplomacy is, in, is an interface where scientists can effectively communicate with policymakers such as uh, the diplomats, uh, who go and negotiate these treaties at the international fora and create uh, outcomes that are potentially enabling for, for both stakeholders. So we have diplomacy advancing science. So diplomats are able to create structures, uh, for example, uh, uh, the CERN, uh, uh, the physics research that is happening at CERN and the Sesame Synchrotron. Science informing diplomacy, scientists are able to inform diplomats on specific processes such as the law of the sea uh, within the UN, uh, then obviously uh, discussions on climate change, and then science improving diplomacy, providing a new interface where uh, dip diplomatic connections won't work. On the other side, how do you uh, actualize science diplomacy? At the strategic level, by creating policy documents which provide good and effective science advice to the policymaker. So if you are able to effectively science communicate, then your policymaker will understand the process. At the operational level, uh, basically lobbying for more uh, allocation of funding and policy instruments to support uh, a certain form of uh, technology, then support uh, at the basal level at you know early career researchers, mid career researchers. Uh, this webinar in itself is an example of support So training, networking, and capacity building. So you are able to cross talk more and more. So at the end of the day, you will have a community that will have a capacity to adopt leadership uh, in new and emerging technologies. So how do we apply that interface uh, for regulations of new breeding technologies? So Mike uh, earlier talked about our project assisting small exporters. So that basically looks at three different levels. First at the level of capacity building, providing scientists and diplomat uh, platforms to basically cross talk, learn from one another and understand the nuances and not just you know create binaries and uh, create the dichotomy going. Second level, developing the same regulatory language as we have within this webinar, uh, people from different countries talking about their regulatory regimes that provides you know, a pathway towards uh, developing some level of harmonization. Then how do you render science advice to create coordination between PD regimes? So all of these PDs, they have expert working groups. So how do you, how you can render science advice uh, between the treaty regimes? So uh, moving on, there's also a geopolitical lens uh, that is uh, that goes amiss in discussions. So countries will basically choose from uh, uh, different matrices, as we can see uh, during the ongoing pandemic as well, vaccine nationalism versus uh, vaccine diplomacy. So these are the considerations that states have. So while we do want the technology to move forward, we also have to look at you know whether it's nationalism that will prevail or multilateral uh, cooperation. Uh, so as scientists, we push for equitable distribution of technologies. We want more international cooperation, but we have to consider the entire matrix when a policy design is being created. So it's a battle between bioeconomy versus biopolitics. So uh, the United Nations hosts different summits where uh, discussion can evolve. One new platform that is coming is the Food System Summit. So one of the pre-summit is going to happen uh, from 26 to 28 of uh, July in Rome. There's a potential for discussions on you know how new breeding technology can be adopted. So with this, I thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very interesting points, uh, Dr. Mo uh, Muhammad Adil. I'm very uh, glad that you have uh, highlighted the uh, process versus the product in regulation and that uh, we see that Latin America is leading the pack in terms of regulation of gene editing. 
and uh, some information on science diplomacy that we need to discuss further. And I hope there are more questions on this as we go along uh, the Q&A. Thank you so much once again, Adil. Now let's move forward uh, to our next speaker who would uh, work, uh, discuss gene editing in Australia, the state of play. And uh, this is uh, our guest, uh, Miss Lucy Dara of uh, is the manager of crop biotechnology policy and supports the director of crop biotechnology policy of crop life australia in the development and advocacy of best practice policy and regulation for agricultural biotechnology policy research and advocacy prior to joining crop life lucy worked with grain growers where she represented grower interests and managed a diverse policy portfolio, including AgVet chemicals, biosecurity, trade standards, and grain classification. She has also worked with the Australian Farm Institute, where her work has been published across several editions of the Farm Policy Journal. Lucy holds a Bachelor of Agriculture from Charles Sturt University and a Master of Environmental Science, Plant Physiology and Genetics from the University of New England. Let's welcome Lucy Dara. Thank you very much. And to everyone, wherever you're joining us from today, hello, good morning, good afternoon, um, or good evening. I'd just like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking with you from today and pay my respects to their elders, both past, present, and those emerging. So CropLife Australia is the peak national representative organisation for the plant science sector in Australia. Our membership consists of both patent holding and generic Australian and international small and large companies. And through, in, uh, through leadership and advocacy, our aim is to achieve a strategic regulatory environment that provides the plant science sector the freedom to operate and ensure that the nation's farmers have access to safe, innovative and modern tools to support productivity and environmental sustainability. Today, I'll just provide you a brief overview of uh, the regulatory landscape for gene technology in Australia and touch on some important consultations being conducted by our national regulators. Some of these were already touched on by Mike and Adil, um, and I'll just go into a bit more of uh, detail around some recent consultations that have some, some pretty big implications for gene technology regulations going forward in Australia. So this slide, just shows a, uh, a quite condensed timeline on national gene technology regulation developments here in Australia. Uh, we have four key regulators um, of gene technology here, including the gene technology regulator and her office of the gene technology regulator, uh, the Department of Health, uh, Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, and the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority. Gene edited plants are regulated by these regulators under what we broadly describe as the National Gene Technology Scheme. At the moment, there are a number of substantial regulatory barriers that impede research, development and commercialisation of products from the plant science sector here in Australia. And these include pre-market regulation of products developed using new breeding techniques, uh, disproportionate regulation of gene editing approaches and uh, broadly a lack of clarity and clear path to market for products from our sectors. There are, however, a number of consultations currently underway or that have recently closed um, that are aiming to address these issues um, and the outcomes of which we hope will promote the growth of new industries across agriculture, medicine and the environment, um, as well as contribute to leading global regulatory standards and potentially even the export of critical innovations while also building stakeholder confidence across the supply chain. Three of these uh, core consultations um, are being conducted by both the Department of Health and Fazans uh, separately in some respects. Um, one of these includes the regulatory impact statement on modernising and future proofing the National Gene Technology Scheme, which closed in March this year. Um, there's also by the Department of Health, the Food Stands Australia New Zealand Act Review, which closed last month. Um, and later this year, we're expecting the um, launching of a consultation for foods derived using new breeding techniques, which has been delayed since its announcement in 2018. Regarding the National Gene Technology Scheme, um, consultation and implementation of these recommendations has been ongoing um, and subject to extensive delays. The third and most recent review of the scheme was conducted um, 
and concluded in May 2018 with key recommendations still yet to be implemented. Uh, more recently, a regulatory impact statement was released in late 2020. Um, however, the proposed options as we see it would lead to the new system being obsolete before it's even implemented and is far from what Australia requires to ensure it has a world best practice regulatory system. Um, while there have been a number of reviews in, recent, um, in the recent past, um, updates have been quite minor. Um, we have had some progress with the deregulation of SDN1 techniques coming into effect in 2019, um, of which those were, were touched on briefly by Mike and Adil. Um, however, there is still some asynchrony in our regulatory system that needs to be addressed before this technology can be truly appreciated. As I mentioned, some of the options proposed uh, by the Department of Health in the recent consultation impact statement um, don't go far enough to address industry needs um, in terms of proportionate and clear regulation. Um, and it is quite concerning that gene editing and other new plant breeding techniques um, haven't been directly addressed and are still considered new despite being under discussion for over a decade now. One of the primary issues facing our system is uh, the disproportionate regulatory burden on certain plant breeding approaches involving gene editing, uh, where the changes in the resulting organism are comparable to that achievable using conventional breeding, uh, but the organism is regulated to the same extent as GMOs. This reinforces two major priorities for the implementation of recommendations, which uh, we believe should be introduced changes to provide mechanisms that enable regulatory certainty and clarity for new and emerging technologies that aren't currently addressed by the scheme, um, as well as improve a regulatory approach in terms of risk and science-based proportionality and regulation uh, for these technologies and organisms that are currently within scope of the regulation. Um, and so just as it exists at the moment, the regulatory system can't keep pace um, and needs some more flexibility to respond to these advances um, to ensure that Australia can really reap the benefits of these innovations. Um, Adil mentioned from the recent consultation what was proposed, a few options proposed by the Department of Health. Um, and what we would like to see is an enhanced option B. Um, and to achieve this, um, we think is the most appropriate way forward, making best use of the implementation process to address these issues um, and the regulation of new breeding techniques while being practical, feasible and consistent with the core principles of the scheme. So ideally this would include um, items such as the recognition of assessments and approvals by other countries uh, with comparable and recognised regulatory frameworks and institutional biosafety committees. Um, as well as more agility to respond to scientific advances of new applications in a more timely manner. We do have a uh, Gene Technology Ministers meeting coming up in August this year, um, where a proposal for the scheme will be presented. So we're expecting a preliminary paper mid-July um, on that one. And we are very conscious as well of ongoing delays uh, from our Department of Health here um, and have shared these concerns with our other regulatory bodies um, in that moving forward. So in terms of our national food regulatory system, um, the Australian New Zealand Food Standards Code is the primary legislation that regulates genetically modified food and food ingredients in Australia um, and determines how agricultural biotechnology companies bring innovative new products to the Australian market. In addition to food safety assessments conducted by Food Standards Australia New Zealand, Agricultural technologies are regulated by the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator and the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, um, just to ensure that all products are associated uh, and associated technologies meet statutory safety requirements. At the moment, as I mentioned, there are some inconsistencies with regulations across regulators. Um, and desirable, it is desirable that uh, consistency is achieved um, with these reviews that are currently ongoing. Um, so amendments to the gene technology regulations in 2019 um, did clarify that the regulatory status of um, organisms that are not themselves categorised as GMOs, but have been derived from GMOs do not match definitions under our food standards code, um, which possesses un unnecessary regulatory burden for products derived from SDN1 techniques, um, despite their deregulation in 2019. Um, <clears throat> And the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator here has been clear that the definition of GMO in the Gene Technology Act does not include organisms derived from DM GMOs, 
that have not inherited traits that occurred because of gene technology or null segregants. So that really highlights the importance of, um, of these consultations here at the moment. Um, in terms of the Fazeen's review of food drive using new breeding techniques, this one's particularly important um, going forward. Um, and as I mentioned, the preliminary report with necessary changes released back in August 2018 um, has been delayed um, following requests for more stakeholder engagement. So this is one that um, we are really looking forward to here in Australia. Um, with the final report, uh, of that released in December 2019, three key recommendations um, were made detailing how NBTs will be regulated and whether they will require pre-market approval in Australia. Um, these were to revise the modern, revise and modernise the definitions in the code and make them clearer and better able to accommodate existing and emerging technologies. Um, another to consider processes and non-process based definitions to ensure that NBT foods are regulated in a manner that is commensurate with risks they pose. Um, and the third important one being to ensure transparency and raise awareness about GM and NBT foods. <clears throat> the evaluation process was completed um, and a new, process, a new proposal to amend the definitions of the code commenced in February last year. Um, however, the consultation has been delayed and as I mentioned, we're expecting that um, mid this year. Um, Um, another important review that I have touched on is uh, the review of the Food Standards Australia New Zealand Act, um, which is currently being conducted or considered by our Department of Health, um, having closed late last month. Um, in terms of its status, uh, in July 2020, the Department of Health um, launched this review with the aim um, being to consider operations um, and legislative changes uh, that could assist Food Standards Australia New Zealand to effectively deliver its statutory functions. Um, we do feel that detail was lacking in this consultation um, in the paper itself. Um, however, there's some interesting commentary there on um, Fazan's powers and the potential extension of these to uh, the enforcement of food standards and recalls, um, data collection and communications about food safety, which is a particularly important one for the trade space, given that um, you know, if, if things do go wrong, we don't want things to be taken out of context or, or appropriated by a trading partner, um, particularly with some sectors facing increasingly technical and phytosanitary barriers, um, which could subsequently increase the difficulty and cost of doing business and potentially create um, economic and compliance impacts for Australian growers, exporters and the broader supply chain here in Australia. Uh, following that overview of those consultations that are um, currently underway that have implications for our gene technology regulations here, I just thought I'd take a brief moment to touch on some of the successes that we've had uh, more recently regarding um, our moratory here in Australia around the production of GM crops, um, commercial production of GM crops. So um, in South Australia, the GM moratorium is now lifted um, on the mainland, however, it does remain for Kangaroo Island. Um, this is a huge success, um, which comes after years of advocacy and gives researchers and growers access to technology that has been available in other parts of our country for a long time. Um, during this process of the lifting of the moratoria, um, 11 local government areas did apply to remain GM free, however, none succeeded. Um, and accreditation and training for, um, for growers and agronomists here um, in South Australia itself has taken off with um, at the moment around 350 of these accredited um, for the commercial production sale of GMC. Um, so the new um, GM legislation in South Australia does provide an incentive for researchers, breeders and farmers um, to trial GM crops under local conditions, which is a huge benefit to our sector here. Um, and it also provides clarity for potential national and international investors in GM technologies. The New South Wales GM crop moratorium um, is also an important one and it will expire on the 1st of July this year, following the government's decision not to continue that ban. Um, with exemptions already in place um, in New South Wales, however, for a long time, um, the lifting of this moratorium should just be business as usual for our farmers and the agriculture sector here, um, but is, is a much needed and welcome change. Um, 
this will bring New South Wales into line with um, all other mainland states in Australia, um, as well as our major international agricultural competitors. Um, and we do believe that this will encourage stronger research and innovation and facilitate access to current and future GM crops approved for commercialisation in Australia. Um, in terms of the global regulatory landscape, biotechnology does continue to gain momentum as a major focus for the world's policymakers. Um, despite being one of the 13 nations on a joint issued statement to the World Trade Organization in 2018 that supported relaxed regu regulations for gene editing, um, no gene edited crops have been approved in Australia as yet. Um, however, over the past four years, um, as well, several countries, including Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Israel, um, the US, have all clarified the regulatory status of gene edited crops and their products uh, with those that do not incorporate foreign DNA currently regulated as conventional plants with no additional restrictions, um, which is different to the situation here in Australia. Uh, more recently, some of Australia's major trading partners, such as China and uh, competitor nations, including Russia and Canada, have also indicated their interest in or are currently considering policy changes related to gene editing and products derived from NBTs. Um, and for plant breeders and technology developers, research and development of NBTs with agricultural applications um, is of course possible in Australia um, for the most part. However, uh, ambiguous and inconsistent regulation uh, still makes it challenging to navigate this space in Australia. Um, the primary constraint for this um, RDNA and commercialisation or lack thereof um, and products from these techniques is the regulatory and cost hurdles that are associated with assessment and the registration process here in Australia. Um, so I'll conclude my presentation there um, and just with a note that, you know, this is a really exciting time to be in the biotechnology space um, and driving regulatory change here in Australia and across the world, um, particularly at a time of unprecedented climate challenge, uh, plant breeding innovations such as gene technologies are vital tools that uh, we can use towards more sustainable food production, um, creating healthier plants, healthier people and a healthier planet overall. Um, the scientific challenges have largely been settled, um, or at least there's a clear path to resolving them, um, according to scientists in the field, uh, but there are definitely some political and social ones that remain um, and that we will continue to work through. Um, if these con consultations that Australia are currently uh, conducting are uh, managed effectively and um, appropriate regulations adopted, um, we're, we're really optimistic that there's great potential to truly harness these critical technologies. Thank you. Yes, very well said. Thank you so much. Oh, those last statements are the key messages of your talk. And thank you very much for providing us the, how, the state of play, what's happening in Australia in terms of regulation and the new breeding technologies, the products are, that are coming and the excitement of uh, some of the parts of Australia, just like the New South Wales, where we have uh, stopped the ban and farmers are, in, are going to enjoy the uh, the freedom to plant uh, vita crops. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you. Now let's move on to our next speakers. Actually, uh, we are now going to have a panel of uh, speakers from Southeast Asia discussing about the NVT policy approaches and implications for markets and trade. So the first speaker would be from Malaysia, and this would be Professor Dr. Muhammad Faiz Fung Bin Abdullah. Is the chairman of the Genetic Modification Advisory Committee and a regular participant and as expert in the CBD Open-Ended Online Expert Forum on Risk Assessment and Risk Management and Synthetic Biology. He is a lecturer in the Faculty of Applied Sciences in University of Technology, Mara, Shah Alam, and he got his degrees of uh, microbiology from University of Malaya and obtain a PhD in molecular genetics from the University of Oxford. Let's welcome Professor Abdullah, please. Sure. All right, I'll first introduce the current biosafety law in Malaysia and the regulating authorities before discussing how the law will affect NBT crops and what is the likely way forward for Malaysia. So NBT encompasses a range of new and emerging plant breeding technology. And at this point, I would say that we are mainly concerned with the first three on the list, namely gene editing, RNA inhibition and synthetic biology. 
Uh, not that the rest are not important, but these three technology are already on the horizon. And especially in the case of gene edited crops, there is a lot of attention and concern on how they will be regulated. The main focus today, I presume, will be on gene editing. So Malaysia has a Biosafety Act enacted in 2007, which regulate all living modified organisms, or LMO, and the release of products from such organisms. So the Safety Act is uh, supported by the Biosafety Regulation 2010, which describes the operational details, uh, and scope and procedures for approval and notifications, and two other regulations, the, comp the compounding of fences and sampling procedures were introduced in 2018 to streamline operation and enforcement. So in general, the Biosafety Act and regulation were drafted in response to the Cartagena Protocol of Biosafety and is very much in line with the wordings of the protocol. So under the Biosafety Act, living modified organisms are defined as any living organism that possesses a novel combination of genetic material obtained through the use of modern biotechnology. So in this case, our regulated trigger is process-based. So that is uh, the process of modern biotechnology will require that the product goes through a, a regulatory process. And modern biotechnology is defined as in vitro nucleic acid techniques, including recombinant DNA and direct injection of nucleic acid in the cells or organelles, or fusion of cells beyond the taxonomic family that overcome natural physiological reproductive or recombination barriers, and that are not techniques used in traditional breeding or selection. So again, uh, the law is worded very comprehensively and would include almost anything that is uh, produced using modern biotechnology. The regulating authorities for the biosafety law in Malaysia uh, is the Ministry of Environment and Water. Okay, and under the Ministry, the, the Department of Biosafety or the OB is in charge of uh, all the uh, operational, administrative and enforcement uh, dealings, they act, they act as a one-stop center to receive application and notifications for interested parties. The decision-making body is the National Biosafety Board, the MBB, which approve application for approvals or notification. The MBB can also make decision on certain policy matters. And if the MBB cannot come to decision on an issue, then it will be escalated to the ministry level. In making a decision, the MBB takes into account many scientific and technical input and risk assessment provided by the Genetic Modification Advisory Committee, or GMAC. For approval of open release, public consultation is also sought, and where there are socioeconomic concerns, there is also a social economic committee that will provide the input. So the National Biosafety Board is chaired by the Head Secretary to the Ministry of Environment and Water, and comprises representatives from seven other ministries, together with four external experts. So the Ministry of Health is there, the Ministry of Science, Agriculture, Plantation, Industry and Commodities, Ministry of Inter International Trade and Industry, Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, and the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources. So the decision-making process is comprehensive and is joint jurisdictional with input from a range of agencies. So next, I'll quickly update on the status of genetic modified crops and products in Malaysia. So this is genetically modified in the, tradi uh, in the traditional sense. They are not GE yet. So uh, until now, there has been no application for commercial planting of GM crops, but for uh, food feeds and processing and for sale of commodity, Malaysia has approved 50 events, the majority of which are corn and ma or maize, soybean and cotton which are mainly brought in to support the uh, animal feed industry. Recently, we have also approved uh, canola and potato. So uh, this will give you a quick idea of uh, what is the uh, uh, market opportunities and in Malaysia if you decide your, to commercialize your product here. Uh, we also approved a few non-food feed and products, uh, processing products, enzymes, larvae science, cut flowers, and so on. And also a few trials for uh, genetic modified mosquito and genetic modified papaya and rubber. So this is made, uh, for genetic modified crops. For genetic, for gene edited crops, okay, so far there has been no application for open release or planting. And there has also been no application for commercialization of food feed and processing. Although we are aware that there are some activities on contained use uh, research and development of these uh, uh, techniques uh, in Malaysia. Uh, this is mainly uh, 
innovative work, research work done by research institute and universities, and there are many in, uh, currently in the R&D stage. They, uh, they include uh, uh, techniques that uses uh, CRISPR and CAS, and uh, most of these are on uh, works on uh, human cell lines, animal and microbes. So far, there's only been one that uh, well, one uh, research group that is uh, actively uh, genetically editing crops. So with that in the background, I will move on to gene edit crops and the regulation in Malaysia. For now, we have no specific policy for gene ed or genome editing. And uh, the issue of, of GM crops is still under discussion and until a decision is, is made. So uh, all uh, GIGE crops will be regulated under the Biosafety Act as modern biotechnology, as product of modern, uh, modern biotechnology. Okay, especially if they include uh, the following characteristic, uh, such as the use of modern biotechnology, the use of uh, the uh, techniques that involve manipulation of uh, uh, DNA and uh, involvement, the use of uh, exogenous or foreign DNA, and where there is a, a genetic recombination that results in LMO. However, uh, where there is scientific uncertainty, uh, specific case of genetic edited crops can be evaluated on a case by case basis as long as they're between uh, definition of the regulatory uh, scope. And these are the issues that's currently under discussion. Uh, we hope to conclude and uh, come to decision soon. So uh, on the ambiguity in uh, regulating specific gene edited plants that contain similar changes that can also occur naturally and uh, genetic edited plants that are produced using a combination of modern biotechnology and natural crossing. And also uh, where the gene editing technique do not result in the integration of foreign DNA and where uh, the products from gene editing uh, may not be uh, reliably detected or monitored. And also uh, some discussion is ongoing with regard to transient RNA deliver, RNA inhibition. So uh, this any of these cases that falls into the gray area or where there's scientific uncertainty uh, can be submitted to the uh, Department of Biosafety and they can be assessed uh, on a case by case basis as defined by the regulatory scope uh, depend, uh, based on the risk factor. And that will depend very much on the event and the intended use. So this is sort of a stopgap measure until we have a firm decision in place. Okay, so in Malaysia, the, uh, the current situation is, I, I would say, uh, discussion is still ongoing, okay, as with the case of uh, many other countries in the world, okay. Uh, I believe that uh, Philippines and Indonesia has made a decision, and I'm keen to listen to the next two speakers, okay. All right, and uh, this slide is just to show that uh, our scientific discussion is going along very much uh, uh, what is being uh, conventionally uh, accepted and uh, regarded as uh, scientific principles. So we are discussing along the line of uh, uh, genome editing and S SDN1, SDN2, and SDN3, and which are the one that could possibly be deregulated under the current regulations, and what are those that may have to be continue regulated under the current laws. Okay, so in conclusion, okay, so for now, open release and continuous activities for gene edited crops Okay, it's still regulated by the existing regulatory framework. GE crops will be regulated as LMO if they fall under the uh, jurisdiction of the current regulation. It's possible that simplified procedure may be developed in near future for NBT crops and can be applied on a case-by-case -case basis. Discussion has started at the scientific and technical level and we hope to conclude soon. And that will be followed by a wider consultation and inputs that will be obtained to have a, a comprehensive framework that's ready to process future release. So you asked me about the outlook, I would say that the biosafety regulation framework in Malaysia has been facilitative and responsible. And I think that we are, good, we are likely to maintain this direction. Mm -hmm. So with that, thank you. And if you have any further, you do need any further clarification, you can contact the DOB on this uh, uh, platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Professor Abdullah. These are very uh, comprehensive uh, a presentation on what's happening regulatory wise in Malaysia. We know that uh, currently there are still discussions and it looks like things are going to go to the right direction, the correct direction as we uh, hope it to be.
And so thank you so much. Uh, may I now uh, ask everyone to please put your questions in the Q&A box, Q&A function, not in the chat box, because we will be looking at the Q&A box. Thank you so much once again, and please stay put, uh, Dr. Abdullah, for the Q&A in a few minutes after the two speakers. Now let's move on to the Philippines, and this would be uh, our presenter would be Dr. Reynante Ordoño. He is a senior science research specialist and scientist one at the Philippine Rice Research Institute and the project leader of the Healthier Rice Project, a collaborative project with ERI on beta carotene enriched golden rice varieties, high iron and high zinc rice to address the problem of micro micronutrient deficiencies in, a, in the country. He was a member of the drafting committee to the Philippines Policy on Products of Plant Breeding Innovations and chair of the ad hoc technical working group of NBTs under the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines. He obtained his bachelor's magna cum laude and MS bio biology degrees from the Central Luzon State University. He was one of my students and later obtained additional MS and doctoral degrees in agriculture, science, agricultural science and postdoctoral fellowship from Nagoya University in Japan. Let's welcome Dr. Ray Ordonio. Yes, hello to everyone and thank you so much, Mam Ola. Lovely to be here. And I would like to share with you this presentation on regulatory approach for products of NBTs in the Philippines. Let me first give you a brief introduction about the case of GMOs in the Philippines. The Philippines is a signatory to the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety to the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity since year 2000. And because of that, our existing regulatory framework reflects the principles of the Cartagena Protocol. Specifically, we define a GMO or LMO, just like the same with Malaysia, as a living organism created through modern biotechnology through such processes as recombinant DNA technology, direct injection of nucleic acids, or fusion of unrelated cells. And of course, they possess novel combination of genetic materials because of the process. As of now, the Philippines has 19 years of experience on GM regulation. This is from the creation of the Department of Agriculture or DA Administrative Order number eight in 2002. Currently, however, the said AO number eight has been replaced by the Joint Department Circular effective April 15, 2016. It is entitled Rules and Regulations for the Research and Development Handling and Use Transboundary Movement, Release into the Environment and Management of Genetically Modified Plant and Plant Products Derived from the Use of Modern Biotechnology. And it's being implemented by the Department of Science and Technology, Department of Agriculture, of course, DNR or Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Department of Health, and the Department of Interior and local government. Now, this is the regulatory process for GMOs in the Philippines. After genetic transformation in the laboratory, the lead event and backup events are determined in the screen house. The best candidate lines for the lead event in terms of the intended trait and agronomic performance and pest and disease response are then determined through a confined test Further additional performance and environmental safety parameters are assessed during the multi-location field trial. It is also at this stage that materials for food, feed, or for processing application is generated. There will also be an application for permit for commercial propagation. Uh, this permit essentially approves or deregulates the event. And so the line can then go through varietal registration and subsequent deployment, but still following defined stewardship protocols. Now, talking about the earlier three stages, the laboratory screenhouse and confined test, these are actually under the purview of the Department of Science and Technology Biosafety Committee. Here in this slide, it is easy to see that the early stages of development of all products of modern biotech in the Philippines is covered by the DOSTBC. 
they had been taking the lead in evaluating and monitoring regulated articles under their contained use since 2009. Then for the later stages, that will be the concern of the Department of Agriculture Bureau of Plant and Industry. And in their case, they issue such permits as navigation uh, permits and permit for direct use as food and feed or for processing. And again, this regulatory process is established for the purpose of ensuring the safety or by safe post because of their perceived risks associated with the novel combination of genetic materials that they possess. Now, in 2018, in view of the exciting developments involving new plant breeding techniques and their potential impact on international trade, the Department of Agriculture Biotech Program Office initiated a study group to look into the state of the art of NDTs and review them from the viewpoint of regulation. Now, fast forward to 2021, we already have the first ever NCDP resolution on NDTs, which was just signed last April. NDTs in the Philippines. The resolution is the uh, Ray, excuse me, Ray. And plant products derived from the U the NCBP or the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines provides oversight to all genetic engineering experiments in the Philippines. The resolution is entitled here. Uh, and this is actually the output of a technical working group in June 2019 that was shared by yours truly. Then The contents of the resolution is based on this decision tree, which we also came up with. The, we examined eight different NBTs based on the possibility of producing novel combination of genetic materials in the final product. And these techniques are site-directed nucleases. There's one to three. And then oligonucleotide-directed mutagenesis, ODM, cisgenesis, and intragenesis. RNA-dependent DNA methylation, grafting with GM material, reverse breeding, agroinfiltration of nuns, and also agroinoculation of germline tissues with cis insert, and lastly, synthetic genomics. As a result, we found that all of the NBTs are capable of producing non-GMOs, while of them, four have an intermediate GM stage, but still the product uh, after breeding out the inserts or the transgenes or vectors, they become non-GMOs. And three of them, as shown in PBI case two, can give rise to a GMO. And these techniques are SDN3 with trans insert, agroinfiltration of germline tissues with trans insert, and synthetic genomics uh, involving trans-like sequence integration. And so the resolution basically states that products with no foreign DNA insertion will be exempted from GM regulation or the joint department circular. For NBT products being developed in the country, we expect that the initial stages of their product development will be covered by the GM regulation under the purview of the Department of of Science and Technology Biosafety Committee until they are granted exemption by the Department of Agriculture Bureau of Plan and Industry through a certificate of non-coverage or simply appearance. For products developed outside the country, like uh, coming from Australia, for example, we expect that the DA or DABPI uh, may issue the same certificate of non-coverage. But as of now, the DA is yet to come up with the specific guidelines for their evaluation and monitoring of NBT products. For now, I can just share with you two slides from the DA, which gives us a glimpse of the possible evaluation process at DA later on. And you see here, first, there will be determination of the PBI or NBT product if it contains a transgene, and this will be via the DABC. And then if no transgene, 
there will just be food and feed or only food safety assessments that will apply. And this will not be as rigorous as in the JDC, like uh, using proximate analysis only by DPI and Bureau of Animal Industry or DPI only. Or if there is no transgene, there will just be an outright issuance of clearance that the product can be used as food or feed and be propagated with no further regulations if there are no biosafety issues. Number four, um, environmental safety assessment will be done if the product will be grown in the Philippines and this will be under the purview of the DPI. And lastly, issuance of clearance instead of certificate of safety issued by PPI or other competent office at uh, DA. And uh, this is also the proposed process flow for the formal assessment or determination of PBI or NBT products intended for commercial use, either for food, feed, or for processing or for propagation. Basically, the technology developer submits the application to the Bureau of Plant Industry Biotech Secretariat, which then assesses the document for its completeness. Uh. And if it is complete, it will be submitted or forwarded to the DA Biosafety Committee, which then decides if the product will be covered by the existing GMO regulation or not. And then the decision will be passed on to the BPI director. And then the BPI director will then feedback to the technology developer. And now for some key takeaways. The Philippines has a regulatory policy through an NCBP resolution on products of new plant breeding techniques, but the fine details are still to be developed by the Department of Agriculture. Now for products of NBTs that do not possess foreign DNA insertions or novel combination of genetic materials, the existing GM regulation or JDC will not apply. Then any product coming from Australia would follow a determination step if it is going to be covered by the GM regulation or not. And lastly, once the NBT policy specific guidelines are formalized by the DA, a certificate of non-coverage or clearance can be obtained from DA BPI for products uh, that are non-GM coming from NBTs. That's all. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray Ordonio. These are very comprehensive points on what's happening in the Philippines. And we're happy to note that now we already have the regulatory policy to be polished by the Department of Agriculture. Thank you so much once again. Now let's move forward to our next speaker who is now from uh, Indonesia. And this is Dr. Bambang Prasetya, is the chairman of the Indonesia Biosafety Committee for genetically modified organism, which provides a recommendation for biosafety on new plant breeding and microorganisms, uh, food, feed, and their derivative products to the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, and Head of Drugs and Food Safety of uh, Indonesia. He obtained his bachelor's degree from Bogor University and got his master's and PhD from Georg August University of Göttingen, Germany. Let's welcome Dr. Bambang Prasetya. First of all, thank you for kind of introduction with Dr. Aldi Mita. I would like to share my presentation entitled Status of Regulation, Development and Product uh, Derived from Genome Editing. Uh, the term is, uh, I think, uh, the same is the new technique breeding. Uh, my presentation. Uh, will be after I introduce this. Uh, right? I would like to share about the regulation, procedure, and assessment system, and brief picture. And can I close my uh, what is? Sorry, the sound is not so too so well. No, it's okay. The sound it's is okay. Good. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then I also share with uh, uh, about the procedure and assessment system. A brief picture about the trade in Indonesia, and also I would like to share my opinion about the strategy of genome editing. Uh, just for the introduction, 
there are a number of the challenges such as the decreasing environmental problem, global warming, population issues concerning number of uh, number of the population and health or quality, decreasing number, including the decreasing quality of crop uh, agriculture land, and emerging disease is also natural disaster. Compared to the conventional and existing technology, as shown in the flag picture and the side, right side, about the milestone of breeding technique, genome editing have a much very potential tools in biotechnology, I think. It is due to more effective, more relative short time, and also cheaper compared with existing GM technology. And the development of the genome editing has been developed rapidly is shown by increasing number of uh, activity of research, number of publication, number of patent registered. Moreover, the genome editing can open broader opportunities, especially in for the uh, developing country like Indonesia and maybe our friend. And also based on this fact, Indonesia thinks that the providing of suitable regulation is very important to boost the uh, development of the GN and utilization of a product. Now I will move to the regulation. This slide show the timeline of regulation and uh, our achievement in biosafety recommendation and certification. There are series of platform regulation derived from the CBD and Cartagena protocol and one of them is uh, I think uh, in Indonesia uh, we released the Government Act, uh, President Act, we call PP number 21, 2005, and then continued by uh, Act number 39, 2010, and 53, 2014. It is about uh, organization structure and authority and task, as well as function of the Biosafety Committee. And recently, from the Ministry of the Agriculture, released the regulation about the control and monitoring for the GM product. This is very important for us also. And parallel to this, I would like to share that uh, starting from 2011, we start release the recommendation for the GM product. Until now, we have already 76 certification, including ongoing process. And once uh, in the this year for the G genome editing product. So I move to the National Consolidation for the Formation of Regulation. Uh, beginning with our analysis and our group study, and we review international uh, portfolio about the genome editing, and then we have a certain FGD with invite several experts from the regulator, from the uh, international expert, we invite from Japan, from Argentina, from Australia also, from the International Rice Research Institute in Philippines. Finally, we have already a decision about disposition of the genome editing, and is now preparing to the making of the guideline. In this, uh, this picture is also the situation uh, about the focus discussion, and also here at some two paper from the Ibu Bahagiawati, Mr. Bahagiawat also released about the position, the regulation of Indonesia. And me also, Mr. Satya Nugraha, also uh, have a review about this position. And the basic concept of genome editing, the first is that the end product contain no forensic. It is uh, our decision. And based on the clarification of SDN, side directed nucleus, SDN1, and SDN2, a question mark, depend on the end product, content uh, gene for engine or not. And then assessment done by uh, technical assessment, uh, technical committee about the characterization of molecular and phenotype. This point, we, we coming and conclude that the, in short, the genome editing, we exclude to the genome edit, uh, uh, we exclude genome editing technology from the existing regulation from the GM product. Even it is the, the team is the same as the assessment, the same is in the GM product. And the decision with the product belong to the GA on the GM product based on the technical assessment from the Biosafety Commission and also the plenary meeting in the uh, international committee. 
we have sporting team. For example, for the technical team from the biosafety for food, it is in the national agency for drug and food, uh, food control. Technical team for biosafety for food in the Ministry of Agriculture, technical team for biosafety environment for, from the Ministry of Environmental and Forestry. And also we have also team for law and social culture and economic assessment. And special for the genome editing, we have uh, set up a team cross-functional from the technical meeting who has uh, the background of biology molecular. We already set up. And just short for the regulation of genome editing, the applicant send the proposal to the Ministry of uh, MOA, Ministry of Agriculture, Environmental and Forestry, and also the National, National NDFC, it is uh, uh, for the food security, uh, depend on the type of the recommendation. It is whether fit or food or environmental biosafety. And then the next step, the application will be sent to the biosafety committee and start the assessment process. The technical assessment will be carried out by the team biosafety and the result by the, the assessment will be sent to the plenary meeting from the biosafety committee and discuss and then we can uh, decide uh, whether it is accepted or not and then when we accept it we send again recommendation to the ministry it is uh, the simple way that, but uh, actually uh, uh, every step is uh, contains several uh, uh, step also but it is the, the main uh, story and special for the assessment this is very important the start assessment consists for like question. First, starting with question: Is there any question? Uh, is there any genetical material? And then, with the answer no, we come to the next question: Is any transgene in the process? When no, that is uh, the product belong to the non-GM. When is the transgenic content in the product in presumed? And then. The question is, is in the end product free of the transgene, when not direct to the scheme of the GMO, GMP we call genetic modified products, when no belong to the scheme of GMO. So this is the uh, main of the, our regulation. And for the non-GMO, so can directly to the releasing by after uh, getting a licensing from the uh, authority, from the Minister of Agriculture, Ministry of Forestry, and also from the uh, national agency uh, control, food control. And the task for the biosafety committee, the first important thing is to provide the biosafety GM product recommendation for the our, our authority, Minister of Agriculture, and we have also certification, and we have also provided the guidance, and also we have uh, the task to, to assist them especially in the supervision and importation of the utilization of PRK, uh, of uh, G, uh, GM product. Uh, talking about genome editing technology, it is maybe must be related to the uh, our condition of the production and import in Malaysia. We imported in uh, several kind of product, but we also uh, produce very strong in the mild rice and also corn self sufficient metal rice production in Indonesia and also corn last, uh, last year, maybe almost uh, sufficient, and then it still uh, uh, in a uh, little portion of Shopian production, but the uh, import, the big one is from uh, from the Shopian and the derivative product and also from wheat. This is the overview the production of trade, uh, of trade and uh, crop. Uh, for example, this is a uh, comparison between production, import, and export for certain important uh, crop, metal rice, corn, as we know all, but uh, uh, the soybean and soybean meal is very uh, hard to uh, be imported from the foreign country. It's mostly 80% is also GM product. This is my last, last slide, uh, that uh, my opinion that uh, genome editing belong to promising technology due to relative, very simple, cheaper, and shorten and compared with GM technology. Genome editing have a good prospective to strengthening the food quality and regulation will be open flexibility and more acceptability by the people, the Indonesian people especially, compared with a, a GM product. And then genome editing will open potential collaboration G2G, government to government, institution to institution, also maybe very 
uh, private company to private company then collaboration is very effective in Indonesia when starting from the research and maybe and the licensing and the joint venture and joint production also in the market and lastly the genome uh, editing I think will boost the utilization of potential our biodiversity for viable product the slide also I saw the potential partner in Indonesia to make collaboration in the development of genome editing uh, our research center the potential one is the research center biotechnology and bio resource genetic in Ministry of Agriculture research center biotechnology and also research center uh, biotechnology and bioindustry research center biotechnology in Indonesian Institute of Science and also some uh, research center from the university for example state university chamber and ipb university and also gajah mada university and also from the industry plan research center belong to the ministry of the agriculture the focus area of the research is rice orange chili sugar cane and or palm and earth mission i think will be broader broader and then we starting the the in the research become interesting and the government now have a new institution we call the indonesian by uh, innovation center it is i think very important to make how to develop GO, GM, uh, GA in Indonesia. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Bambang. And uh, we are happy to note that uh, Indonesia is also gearing up towards genome editing or uh, NDT product uh, policies, which would allow uh, Indonesians to harness the benefits of this technology. Thank you so much. Uh, currently, there are so many questions, and I know that uh, we are running out of time, but we need to tackle this very important question. So we'd like to introduce our global coordinator, Dr. Mahalek Chumi Arojanan, uh, to moderate our Q&A portion. So she is a renowned science communicator in agribiotechnology. She has received numerous recognitions and is a member of the advisory committee for biotech in the Malaysian government, industry advisory panel for seven universities, the Cornell Alliance for Science, Farming Future Bangladesh, and Mustafa Science and Technology Foundation for Women. She has a PhD in Science Communication, Master of Biotech from University of Malaya, and BS in Microbiology from University Putra, Malaysia. So let's welcome Dr. Maha. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aldamita. Thank you so much for all the very enriching presentations. We learned a lot, and I'm sure this will be uh, creating a momentum for gene editing, uh, gene edited products. Now, you know, being a moderator is not easy because if we don't have questions, we have to make up the questions and now I'm spoiled for choice. So I'm going to use my discretion as a moderator to choose the question. Now, I was eyeing on this question as a first question, but I see that Adil has answered this, but I think this is really important. So I'm going to bring this question again from Dr. Norwati Atnan from Malaysia. And she's asking, what's your opinion related to harmonization process in Southeast Asian countries? I think this is really important and I, I want other uh, presenters to also put in your uh, perspective. So Adil has responded and he has given Latin American example as a good case study for Southeast Asian countries. but how can we take it to reality? What can countries, individual countries do? Anyone wants to take this up? Including the panelists from the three countries. Hi, Ma. So, uh, can I answer this? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, for with regard to individual countries, I think it is dependent on taking a mission approach towards regulations. Uh, right now, what happens is that these regulations, they're evolving in silos. So if there is more crosstalk between different de uh, departments, understanding what their, you know, uh, objectives and assessments are at the end of the day, you move towards creating a national level uh, of legislation. Then obviously, the second level is looking at regional forums. So we all, uh, different states have regional organizations. You push that agenda, for example, in Southeast Asian country, ASEAN forum is the best one. So you do a discussion related to uh, regulations on that forum. And then through that regional representation, you go towards the UN forums as well. So this is how you create a leadership in the longer run. But it begins at uh, uh, increasing crosstalk between your uh, sub-state organizations, including universities, uh, relevant regulatory offices, and you know, uh, understanding what is this uh, mindset uh, of the regulator at the end of the day and how you can effectively answer them. Yeah, 
Okay, thank you, Adil. So we really need to work on a platform, but we also need individual countries to take up this challenge, right? Because we have been talking about this even for genetic modification or uh, genetic engineering. It's a it's a tall order. So we hope you know individual countries will also come up, and this will definitely re uh, reduce trade barriers and collaboration. Now the other interesting question is from Dr. Uh, Deepa. I suppose Dr. Deepa Navanath uh, from India. Now she's asking. What is the uh, the regulatory process for genetic uh, gene edited? Is it the same as G, uh, genetic modification? So we we are always talking about is it going to be regulated or not regulated? How about the regulatory process itself? All the analysis and testing done is it going to be the same or how different is it going to be? Uh, Mike, do you want to take this question? Okay, thanks. Um, well. <clears throat> um it depends it depends on 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 the nature of what what you're looking at so sdn1 uh gene editing without any introduced uh, uh dna you you it's hard to see why this should be regulated as gm it's it's quite different now first of all but i would preface this by the fact that there's actually nothing wrong with gm itself and 11 percent of the world's food is actually from gm uh gm crops anyway so let, if we say that, but I mean, uh, there are more issues related to that, but um, if there is no um, introduced DNA, why, why on earth should it be treated any differently from uh, conventional breeding, which after all is also uh, providing new combinations of genetic material. That's the whole point of, of conventional breeding. And there are many um, it, it, things which are, are not, are not logical for example you know a crop like triticale is a completely artificial crop a combination of wheat and rye that doesn't ex exist in nature there's no regulation there if you buy bread in australia it's probably got genes from rye in it for resistance to stem and leaf rust and those are um, uh, transferred by cytogenetic means and not by a recombinant dna and so they're not regulated but they're clearly it's 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 the gm so uh, there are some inconsistencies here, but if you get to, to, to certainly SDN1 products or SDN2, where they're uh, essentially you could achieve that same, uh, may well be able to achieve the same outcome through conventional breeding, then there's absolutely no reason why those should be regulated as GM crops. Thank you, Mike. I think that answered the questions, uh, at least three questions put uh, forward here by Shahid Ahmad. From the question Shahid Ahmad, I see that you want gene editor crops to be regulated. And I'm going to take your questions, but uh, uh, Professor Mike Jones already addressed some of it. And your question is why gene edited crops are treated are not treated as GM? I think uh, Mike responded to the question. You also asked questions like, is GM or gene edited crops when they are internationally traded are they going to be supported by um by data or information i think what you're asking is will data uh, or the information about the product uh, accompany this uh, gene edited uh, products when they are internationally traded so mike do you want to take this question as well how different will uh, will the trade be for gene edited uh, products <clears throat> Well, be, to be perfectly honest, they're, if they're deregulated, um, there's no reason for them to be treated any differently from the, than co conventional crops that are traded. So um, that, that's how I would see the regulations, the logical uh, way that regulations should go. We certainly don't want another tier of regulation for GE crops. You, you know, that, that would be completely counterproductive. So the same sort of information that has to be provided by uh, people who trade in conventional crops, that's the same sort of information that would be provided for GE crops uh, if they're being deregulated. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, certainly, it's, you know, this would be just a, just yet another barrier to, to, to trade, which um, I don't think is very helpful. Yep, sure. Thank you, Mike. And here's a question from Supra. She's asking, is there a list of commercially approved gene, uh, genome edited SDN1 crop globally? So maybe a database. I don't know if Ola wants to answer this question. Currently, we are really trying to have one, but uh, we have uh, still to look at uh, where they are, what they are. Um, since most of uh, the SDN1 crops 
uh, do not pass through regulation. So it's very hard to track because some of them are considered, well, all of them are considered to be conventional. So what we can do is just to, to make, uh, to have a roster of what these are, but not how much area is planted to this. So that is really possible. The trade, the crops, which are SDN1 uh, derived, and uh, the company which produced that. That could be possible, but of course, we need to have funds to have it if you will help us to, to get it. Thank you. <laughs> sure, Isa is willing to do that, uh -huh. but if there is um, fund provided. Now I'm gonna move on to addressing public acceptance. Here's a question from Sasham to Prof Jones, but Adil, please jump in as well. I'm gonna combine two questions here. One is from Sasham, who is asking, how would you uh, address public acceptance? And there is another question, how would you counter the negative influence on GE? Uh, from uh, the EU negative influences on GE regulations, which uh, this person feels is not science-based. At the end of the day, that's the, the magic bullet, you know, getting people to accept uh, technology. So consumer perception uh, in any way, it's, it's, it's changing, but it, it's a lot dependent on three different levels. First, A, how scientists are effectively able to communicate their uh, innovations and technologies. Like, uh, are they getting the message across? At times, people feel overwhelmed by the jargon. At the second level, are policymakers, you know, abreast of the developments that are taking place at the international level? What happens at time is that, you know, the communication that reaches them is not uh, presented in a simplified or a tangible manner. And thirdly, how the international regimes, they understand uh, uh, the proliferation of, you know, uh, or the commercialization of biotechnology at large. So at these three different levels, at the end of the day, consumer perception is based on how these three levels will evolve. Then on a related note, it's also about how uh, the, so the EU and negative perception. So th that's changing as well. There's been a lot of, uh, there, there's been official publications as well that uh, scientists have advocated that, you know, to move towards the science driven agenda. But at the end of the day, there will be uh, different lobby groups. So what can effectively be done at the level of the scientists is accurate science communication and advocacy at the level of, uh, you know, the uh, policy stakeholders, more science diplomacy, scientists and policymakers talking together uh, and creating new forms of dialogues where, you know, uh, one side is not overwhelmed by the other. So that, that is how basically you can provide evidence to the perception of the people. Sorry. Uh, well, well, first of all, I, I'm just adding that to my experience, we were invite, asked to, uh, by Horticulture Innovation Australia to uh, review uh, potential acceptance of GE products for, in the vegetable industry in Australia. And we, we talked to, from, from everyone from breeders, scientists, breeders to marketers and so on. And, and virtually they all said, well, look, if we, we'd love to use this technology, but as long as it's not defined as GM. So if you then, uh, if it's deregulated and it's not GM, then they're happy to use it. Um, now in Europe, well, there's a special case because they, the way that they come to their agreements, first of all, you've got well, no, 27 odd countries there and they have trouble coming to agreements as you can see like, with the COVID situation, for example. Um, and also that they have non-governmental organizations which uh, lobby um, the governments there and, and the, the decision makers and they provide a lot of dis disinformation to be perfectly honest. So it's very hard uh, for them to, to get uh, clear information. Also, you have to have confidence in the regulators. And if you have confidence in your regulators and, and, and the evidence is that something is completely safe, then, then you will get better uh, acceptance. But also I should add that there is a strong push by all the scientists and researchers uh, and organizations in Europe to have the decision that has been made on uh, SDN1 gene editing as being GM in Europe, have, they, have that reversed. So there's a lot of pushback at the moment. Mm -hmm. So personally, yeah. I, I would not be surprised if that pushback doesn't result in a change in legislation in due course. Um, and, and as soon as you have something is deregulated, it's not GM, then the acceptance will, will mm -hmm. automatically follow, I believe. Yep. Now, I would like to also turn to the three panelists from the three countries we have here. Uh, what is being done in your country, very briefly, to, we are not going to lobby for GM, we are not going to be lobbying for gene edited uh, products, but then like what Prof. Um, uh, Jones was saying, how can we instill trust in regulations and also be uh, promote 
technology, science-based technologies. Um, Prof uh, Faiz, do you want to uh, go? Hi, right, thank you. Uh, I think first and foremost, uh, being open is important. So uh, there should be a lot of conversation on, on, on this aspect uh, in, the, in the social media or, or on any media platform, okay, uh, 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 describing both the uh, advantage and disadvantage. Yeah. So, and then, uh, and, and I strongly believe that educating the next generation is important because uh, after all, we have a law because it, the people want a law. Okay. So if the people understand that uh, uh, GE products can be, ben can be beneficial despite uh, whatever potential risk that can be mitigated, then I think acceptance will be on the rise in that way. In that way. So I, I would go for educating the pub uh, public. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Faiz. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, in case Indonesia, I think same with Malaysia. First point is important to make awareness from the regulator and also for the people. This is very important. And I'm sure that this GA building awareness is uh, much more easier than the GM. Because when already scientifically uh, understand, so it is easy to educate the people. So maybe for Indonesia, because it's already once is the uh, application and then we can release and then maybe this is will be waiting of the assessment. Mm. And Thank the you. research of this, uh, of Indonesian research, maybe uh, beside the, the for foreign product, done it very intensively. Then, and, and take time, maybe two or two years, uh, three years ago, uh, three years coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Bambang. Uh, Dr. Ray, you want to try again? Yes. Hello, uh, Maha. Yeah, yes, I good. believe that public uh, acceptance is really key to the success of an NBT product or even a GM prop later on. And for that reason, we are observing transparency in the regulatory process as applicant. We, we show the public that uh, the documents are submitted to the regulators and the regulators approve it through a process, a certain process. So we want to instill trust of the public to the institution also, to Philrest or to Erie, for example. And uh, they want, we want to show them that us scientists are really developing products for the sake of the public. And uh, what matters to us is really safety after all, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ray. I think what is important is also um, since most countries are in the process or stage of developing the new regulations or strategies, maybe a wide um, scale of consultation involving all stakeholders will also be helpful. So still on uh, uh, social acceptance, I've got another question here. Do we have any extensive study on social acceptability of gene edited plants in Asia? I think, um, Ola, you are yeah. smiling. I'm sure you will say we will be happy to do. <laughs> ISA did it in 2003, 2005. We did a, a large scale um, a, a public uh, on G, okay. yeah, on G, uh, uh, gene, uh, genetic engineering or genetic modification. We will be very happy to do. And I'm sure Murdoch will be very happy to do. All we need is funding. <laughs> okay, I have a technical question, not, okay, regulatory questions um, from Celia. Chalam. Now, SDN1 is like deregulated in Australia. How about SDN2 and 3? And uh, do you think SDN2 and 3 will be deregulated? Okay. Uh, well, SDN1 at the moment is deregulated. And as I understand it, SDN2 and SDN3 are not deregulated. Um, now, um, that could, uh, I mean, uh, I think. Uh, that's it. It depend. It, I think it will depend, though, and I think with further discussion, it will depend exactly on 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 what has been introduced and how much, for example. So, uh, I believe at one point, and, and and maybe Dr. Ray can answer this, but in for example, in in Philippines, they're considering the SDN two with nineteen bases introduced was uh, 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 accepted. But if you had more than twenty bases, then it was it was regulated as a GM. So there are sort of issues like that as to what uh, for SDN one, how many bases uh, should one be concerned about, uh, and what, what might be their origin. But I think that uh, in 
if, if you took that on a case by case basis, you should get, uh, there should be uh, deregulation of, of many um, products. Um, and I mean, just take, you know, if you look, if you take the science background, you say, well, wheat's got 17 billion bases in it. And we eat hundreds of bases of, you know, genes a day. One base in 17 billion or two or five or one gene actually makes absolutely no difference to, to the food that you eat. So um, a lot of this is a very esoteric discussion, um, uh, which for some reason doesn't take place for conventional food, where there's all sorts of changes like that going on, rearrangements, duplications, and so on. So I think there's over-regulation of, uh, of, of GE products at the moment, but and we have to work our way through that. Yeah. Thank Can you. I just I clarify? Yes, please, please, Ray. Yeah, for, for SDN2 in the Philippines, it doesn't mean that uh, once it exceeds uh, 20 base pairs or become base pairs, it's automatically considered as GM. What we're pushing is that aside from that determination of uh, small change in the DNA or small insertion, there should also be homology testing through the, the sequence. Uh, we're pushing for uh, SDN2 as having only a maximum of 19 base pairs for simplicity in the regulation because we don't want to um, have a pile of uh, applications that are actually not really meant to be reviewed so much, but then they pile up because they're put branded as SDN3. So we want uh, like uh, a free a fast lane for them so that they will not be overregulated. So we want that SDN2 will not be regulated, provided that there is just a minimum or I mean a maximum of 19 base pairs in it. For the uh, SDN3, or once it gets to 20 base pairs, then it will automatically be moved to SDN3. And that will be a case by case analysis considering the homology as well. Thank you. That's yeah, thank you so much for that information. Now, still on deregulations, I've got another question from Sonny Lin. And um, the question is, since SDN1 is deregulated by OGTR, what are the policy or discussions related to separating this, this non-GM, which is actually gene edited products, from the supply chain of organic products? Well, for example, in Australia, in Western Australia, we have GM and non-GM canola. Uh, and so that's now routinely segregated uh, um, and sold either as non-GM or GM. So, I mean, exactly the same could be done for organic if that were required. Uh, and we segregate large uh, different uh, categories of wheat and different categories of barley, whether it's malting quality or not, whether, the, whether it's got high protein level or for feed. Those are all segregated in the system very effectively. So I don't think there's any reason why one could not uh, segregate uh, organic produce if that was desired. Mm -hmm. Okay, still on organic, that's another question here on uh, how strong is organic uh, farming lobby in uh, Australia that are uh, likely to affect GMOs? Oh, well, of course, there's also a lot of noise uh, from the organic side. And, and if you go into your supermarket, you'll see the organic lane, but actually the area the broad scale agriculture in Australia is non is non organic, so the broad scale wheat and barley and canola are not organic. Um, so on a small scale, there's organic crops, and the lobby there is again it's disproportionately loud because in fact they use about fifty percent of the same chemicals as as uh, conventional agriculture. Not not even talking about GM. Um, so if copper sulfate could be used as an organic compound. I mean. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So, um, but the lobby is quite strong and vociferous, uh, as in other countries. But uh, I think you have to look at it. Uh, but in, in terms of a percentage of production, it's still relatively small. Thank you, Mike, for mentioning that. And I always tell, why do you spend so much when the same chemicals are using used for organic as well? Now, I've got a very specific question to Professor Abdullah here, uh, Dr. Faiz Abdullah. And I think this, although it is about GM, but in the future, I think it will also relate to GE. The approval conditions for GM products in Malaysia comes with conditions that are imposed on the ap applicant, but these conditions are not under the control of the applicant. For example, cleaning up spills, 
Can GMAC review this requirement and recommend a more rational approach to approval conditions currently imposed on all applicants for GM mm. crop approval? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I believe that uh, most country will have some kind of regulation if you know a container carrying uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of GM corn uh, overturned on the road and spilled the content. So uh, that will have certainly have some environmental risk. Okay? And uh, there will be regulation to clean that up. I think in Australia, there, there will be a sort of a, the, the, the transporter is required to clean up and even dig up the soil six inches or something like that. So that was the uh, uh, condition that uh, the Department of Biosafety imposed. And this is actually uh, due to an exemption. We actually apply a simplified approach provided under the biosafety legislation to facilitate the procession approval uh, for the purpose of uh, food feed and processing. So, uh, and because of that, there's a gap in the responsibility and compliance to the terms and condition. So as far as I know, the Department of Biosafety is in discussion with the relevant regulatory authorities including the, the truckers, the, the shippers, and so on, and, and see how to transfer this specific responsibility to the importer through related permits. So we are working on that, and hopefully we can resolve this uh, in due time. Thank you, Dr. Faiz. We are now moving on to GE uh, animals. I've got a question here. Um, with GM Salmon now in the market, uh, place in North and South America and potential GE animals coming through our uh, research and development stage now, will there be acceptance and assessments for GE animals? Can I respond to that? Oh, yes, sure. Ola, please go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm involved in the animal biotechnology on GE and it looks like most of the GM are, uh, animals are not getting into the market and it's only uh, our salmon, our uh, aqua bounty salmon, which is a GM which has reached the market. So most of our animal biotechnologists looking at the way GE or GNED or genome edited animals are being developed and acceptance is looking very good. Looks like most of our uh, animal biotechnologists will be using genome editing at this point. So we cannot look back anymore at genetic engineering of crops. Uh, scientists are looking forward to genome editing. Mm. Thank you, Ola. I've got a question here on mutagenesis from David Tribe. Hi, hi, David. So here is the question. Will recent development in high throughput, I think it's high throughput, conventional mutagenesis bypass uh, GM regulatory bar barriers and doing what gene edited uh, products does not, uh, does but less cleanly? Will this change the discussion? So basically with the high throughput conventional mutagenesis bypassing the GM regulatory, and GE products um, and doing what GE products does, but of course less cleanly. Will this change this discussion? Well, I, I, I don't know the answer, of course. So I don't really know about a uh, high high throughput um, mutagenesis, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it should change it because if that's non, uh, non, uh, not, un, not regulated, then there's absolutely no reason why uh, more precise uh, gene, uh, gene regulated products should be regulated. So, I mean, I think in a way that would affect it in a positive uh, way uh, and it should um, also help promote acceptance. Unless of course, people wanted to, uh, wanted to decide that uh, uh, conventional mutagenesis is actually GM. Presumably it won't go that way. Yeah, the mutagenesis, the high throughput mutagenesis. Um, after all, it's just mutagenesis and there's no insertion. And so that should be within the realm of conventional building. So it's not regulated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ray. I'm looking for this question on capacity building from Professor Jenny. Let me get that question because I think it's so important that um, we tackle capacity building. Oh, is that answered? Maybe that's answered already then. Okay, Anita has got a question for uh, Prof. Jones. Uh, what are the types of GE uh, crops that are in the pipeline that may be commercialized in Australia? Um, well, a lot of that is commercial in confidence, so I can't really answer that question. But I know, for example, that people were working on um, frost tolerance in wheat, uh, for example, the work that we have going on uh, improving the nutritional property of potatoes, 
These are all things in the pipeline. Um, and I'm sure that all the, the major breeding uh, companies and the CSIRO are actually uh, working towards developing GE crops. So, but it's, uh, they will be for the, uh, on the whole, for the same sort of things that would be uh, aims in, in conventional breeding, but there will be things for improved human health, like changing in oil content, changing protein content, yeah. reduced anti-nutritional compounds or toxic compounds present. That's a very large area, for example, removing uh, naturally present toxic compounds. So uh, we have a project in that area on quinoa on removing uh, anti-nutritionals and saponins just started. So th those are uh, those sorts of things could, uh, are in the pipeline, but uh, they haven't come out of the other end yet, though hopefully mm -hmm. they will. There was a question from pa Bambang. I think uh, he was asking, who's what drives um, uh, Mike? You you were saying now that more uh, smaller private sector companies are coming in into the space of developing gene edited products. What is driving this force? Um, sorry, I am not sure about the uh, the event, but it has come from the research center for bio biotechnology and resource genetics and from the Ministry of the, from the research center from belong to the Ministry of Agriculture from the not from the private company okay that's Indonesia right Indonesia yeah. that's Indonesia but uh, we, I was asking about um, I think this question is to Prof Jones uh, Mike um, because your presentation said that there are a number of companies smaller companies coming into this space so what is driving this? Well, it's because uh, if, if you deregulate uh, SDN1, then it means you can just uh, use those products. Th those products can be treated as any, any plant breeding. So if you have a small company which couldn't afford to meet the regulatory requirements for, for GM crops, they can meet them because, in fact, it no, then becomes no different from conventional breeding. So any small breeding company, uh, you know, State Department of Agriculture or, or a university breeding program can now use these technologies and the costs for and the path to market uh, are just so much less than they would have been if it was labeled GM. So then that attracts additional investment and, different, and additional opportunities for the people who see those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Dr. Fusao from Japan, he, is giving, he has given some information here. GABA rich tomato will come up on ma in the market in Japan soon. Congratulations. We have listened uh, to many presentations on this uh, tomato, and we are waiting for that. There's a question from Marilyn. Uh, she's asking, do you think the diversity of crops can be affected by the introduction of GE crops? The same issue, the same questions we have been answering uh, for decades on GM. Is it any different for GE? If it, I, I would say it's no different. I mean, I mean, for than the conventional breeding, you know, uh, the bottleneck in breeding uh, and in germplasm happened, has happened a long time ago as we have uh, domesticated wild species and then intercrossed uh, and so on. And you, there's a narrowing down of the genetic base. Now, that's got nothing to do with GE or GM, because, in fact, in many cases, Though those new traits are added to elite varieties which have been developed through conventional breeding. So I don't see that the um, GE or, or GM should actually change that situation at all. And Australia, you have so many invasive crops brought by, um, brought by Europeans many, many years ago. Well, actually, there's every crop is an invasive crop apart from macadamia nuts. There's only one... <laughs> one uh, one crop which is indigenous to Australia, and that's macadamia nut. And all other crops, all the germplasm has been imported uh, from elsewhere, uh, and that continues to be the case. So uh, yeah. well, we're used to importing lots of material from all over the place. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I have to stop here. And thank you so much for all the questions. And I'm sorry if I was not able to pick up your questions. There are just so many questions. Thank you so much. And thank you to the speakers and the panelists. Back to Ola. Thank you so much, Dr. Maha. And uh, I know that uh, there's a very interesting exchange going on, but we have to stop. And I'd like to invite everyone <coughs> to please look at the chat box for the uh, post-webinar survey. 
So this is going to be your ticket to get your certificate. Some of you already responded to the pre-webinar survey. So we now have the post-webinar survey and uh, please respond to it and we'll have uh, we'll give you the certificates. I'm not going to uh, talk uh, any longer because we have already surpassed our time. But first I'd like to, can we have a gallery here? Uh, if we can have all the panelists uh, pictured in the in this view so that we can give them a big thanks, uh, of course, to our uh, co-hosts at this point, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Michael Jones, Adil, Mohammed, and Lucy has already left, uh, Professor Abdullah, Professor uh, Dr. Bambang Prasetya, and Dr. Ordonio. Thank you so much for being very excellent panelists. You have provided us <clears throat> very comprehensive presentations and we have been enlightened so much with all your uh, presentations especially the countrywide the australia and the southeast asia scenarios we'd also like to congratulate our uh, webinar moderator of course maha for putting all of this together i know it's very tough but uh, you did it very well and i would like to invite everyone to have uh, your uh, if you're not yet um a subscriber to our crop biotech update please subscribe so we have our crop biotech update here this is a newsletter uh issued by released by isa southeast asia center drum beat released by africa isa africa center and the petri dish by uh malaysia biotechnology information center so we'd like with that i would like to uh, thank you once again and let's continue to be educated on biotechnology. We have been educated very well on genetic engineering and still we're having problems on acceptance. Now we have this new technology, the genome editing harmonization is needed so that everyone, all of the countries needing new technologies will get the benefits. And ISA is here to help you out in all of the uh, new technologies and we have been we are extending our uh, service our information drive or our information activities to new sciences we yesterday we had gene drive today we have again new breeding technologies and and we invite you to partner with isa as we move forward thank you so much and let's have a good day let's have a good evening and uh, see you again next time in another ISA thank webinar. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.